Yeah, it was written at uh, Tony Jackson. He wrote the song at uh, 3445 South State Street. That's he light number uh, number two. See, he light number one is where I was playing at 3030 State Street. And he light number two is 3445 Teen Ann Jones's place. And uh, Ziegfeld's fathers hit town, and they were out slumming a bunch of them, and they heard heard this song, because it was used all up and down State Street during those years, and they fell in love with it, and told the boss man about it. So he come out, heard it, and he, he bought it for $250. And uh, Tony didn't make any money off the song other than that $250 until that, uh, after 20 years, you know, when you sell a song, it reverts back to you after 20 years. That is back in those days, I guess. So. The law still stands. And, uh, but Tony didn't live long after that. And the way he wrote it, why Zeke Fell couldn't publish it that way, because Fanny Bryce had to sing it. And it's all about, uh, it's about a girl, you know. So the Zeke fell himself got, got this uh, Gus Kahn to rewrite the song. But uh, he kept the same music for the chorus. And uh, they made a little baby song out of it for Fanny Bryce. And uh, it went over so big God, he, he hadn't sold it. I guess he'd have been a Tony to been a millionaire for the way that's got to an international hit. It's a big hit all over Europe, the same as as throughout this country. And the way he wrote it went like something like this. There's a certain girl in my neighborhood that I certainly am crazy about in a certain way she stole my heart one day and it's hers without a doubt now the other day while on my way for just a quiet stroll I met this girl with brains of world speaking of her jelly roll she looked at me and sighed Then to her I replied You may talk about your jelly rolls But none of them compare with my baby My pretty baby She's a tall dog gal with big brown eyes and curly hair I call her baby my pretty baby Now maybe not today But there'll come a time When you hear those Church bells chime When it comes to loving That's exactly why she shines This pretty baby Of mine But none of them outshine This pretty baby of mine Yes, good-looking baby of mine well, you, How do you like? Fine. Hey, you were a close personal friend of Tony Jackson. Very much so, very much so. For 20, over 20 years, we run around together. And he was from New Orleans. New, he's from New Orleans, yes. Yeah, the Whitman uh, sisters brought him out of New Orleans. 
That was a great act in those days. They were, um, they, they were real light, you know, light skin, you know, looked like uh, for white people, white girls, but they weren't. Of course, there's a lot of them down there. <laughs> Same thing, you can't tell. But looking at them, a lot of them right here, you can't tell. But, but you could tell very much Tony and I. No doubt. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Oh, we had quite a time. And uh, Tony had another, uh, another tune. Uh, some, uh, some sweet day, yes. Yeah.
What do you think? Yeah, it's your own. Do you uh, remember one that uh, Tony, I believe he wrote called Michigan Water? No, I've never, I've never heard Michigan Water. Didn't you and uh, Tony collaborate and write a number, uh, a musical toast of some sort? Uh, no. The, the Clock of Time? And mm, no. That's, that's the, well, we, uh, we helped with that, but that was the, that's what they're arguing about now, this uh, Sidney Harris, the papers about this rock and roll stuff. Gee, that's, I don't think any, any, any folk were born in rock and roll stuff. We used it in 23, and back there where Dawson's headquarters was, at 3520 State, that was a dreamland in those days. And uh, uh, we had, uh, it was to the, you know, this round the clock stuff? That's what Fess Williams, when the Regal Theater was, before it was built, five or six years before the Regal was built, we was using it at 3520 uh, uh, South State Street. <laughs> We, we had to, uh, the, the way it went was, um, My baby takes hold. I looked at the clock, the clock struck one. I says, honey, haven't we got fun? She kept on rocking me with steady roll. And it goes on around the clock. Every, every hour is another rhyme to fit that hour. was working with then was uh, the same fellow that was Joe Lewis's dietitian when Joe was fighting in a, a bottom, Bill Bottom. He's out did all those, uh, whatever, we stayed in Joe's camps, you know, when he was training for a fight. And because he was an ex-cook himself before he opened this, this uh, uh, cabaret on the south side. And he stopped, uh, stopped us from using that sound in his place. He said it was too rough for his place. And wouldn't let us use it in there. But of course we had to cut it out. But some of the people like it there, and that's the beginning of those, that type song. That is in Chicago. Beginning of in Chicago, that is funny because that is Fess Williams' first, uh, first uh, job in Chicago. He brought it here. He came here from Kentucky, and I don't know how old it was in Kentucky, but it was, no one, no one around yet ever heard any rock and roll songs until, until he came out with it. And, uh, and uh, incidentally, he was uh, the one that opened the Regal Theater. The first uh, uh, act in that theater was Fess Williams, opening night. He was good, he was a saxophone player. But he wasn't a good saxophone player to play with band, you know. He was just one of them fellows that you, everybody else stay down and just let him play at his style. It was one of those odd things. Like Louis was then, Louis wasn't no, playing the same style, but couldn't nobody. They 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 used to come out there every night. Uh, they we had a balcony in this place, and uh, and uh, they used to come out in tuxedos, or I'd get there around one thirty and two. Fellows, so colored and white, sit up in the balcony and drink beer because you know it's cheaper up there than to come down. And we found out they were just coming there listening to Louis. Yeah, because everything Lou would do, they were leaning over that rail, and, and the other fellows would have take the breaks in those numbers, and quietness. The minute Lou would do anything, yeah. <laughs> I said, he, that guy was, he was the greatest summer player then, but didn't nobody know it. You know, it was so odd. His style was so odd, so different from, from anything anyone had ever heard. And, it, and him in that handkerchief, because he was using it then. 
And they had a, we had a pretty good little old band out there. It was eight of us. Did you ever hear of Leo? Is it the King Oliver band? Oh, yes. Yeah, that was it. Uh, they faced you. But you couldn't hear him much because Joe or King didn't let uh, Louis do much playing. Lou wouldn't be doing much playing now if King had lived. King was the best drummer player. No, there's never nothing. I, I don't I doubt whether well, there'll ever be another King Oliver. You ask Louis. You don't have to ask anyone else. Just ask Louis. Louis stayed seated. Joe, uh, Oliver stood up in the band. Did all the breaks and that three stuff. But he, got, he had pyrrhea, and he, had, he lost his t all of his teeth before he passed. And you can't play trumpet with Dennis's teeth like you can with your own. <laughs> oh, no. You'll never be the same when you lose your front teeth if you're a trumpet player. Gee, what a player, what a player that fellow was. You, you ever see Kane with that funny oh. eye? He had one funny eye. He's holding <laughs> That, that's funny, I was looking right at you. <laughs> well, what was your impression of the, the band as a whole? Uh, oh, as a jazz, jazz band, I, I don't think anything could touch it because they didn't play nothing but that, that style of music. They didn't never jump in and play no waltzes or, or nothing else, just, just straight jazz. Some of it you'd heard and some you hadn't. And the clarinet marmalade. And I learned all those things from those fellows. And, uh, oh, it's that other thing that's, uh, see the, rec the uh, somebody's made a, an arrangement of it, uh, uh, oh. <laughs> you ought to know it. Here's the piano part. Yes, I couldn't think of the name of it, yeah, because there's a great clarinet, the clarinet's got the lead in there. Jimmy Noon used to play it the whole three years I used to like Jimmy, that was his masterpiece. You what a clarinet player that guy was. You, you fellas could have heard him. He, Jimmy's just been dead in the Lord, for about 12 years, 12, 14 years. He, great big guy. Good. Jimmy didn't weigh much this piano. Almost. He <laughs> a great clarinet player, he was. And in those days, though, that I'm talking about, that's when this great, the greatest clarinet player we got to do the door today is Benny Goodman. I mean, you could, you'd see him two and three times a week, sitting at uh, 35th and County Met. Joe would let him sit in, you know. He used to ask Joe to let him sit in. He'd sit in with a couple of the boys. And he was a heck of a reader then, Benny Goodman was. But he, he didn't know that, he didn't have the swing of the, of the, the right time. Evidently, I guess that was his reason. Because he'd come out there two and three times a week and ask Joe to let him sit in with him. And see, Van Joe had about tw ten, mostly, and twelve pieces. And it'd all be colored and just that one white kid. You know, and you'd say, who's that white kid? Up there? And he played the clarinet, don't he? Which he did. He could do more than, than the clarinet player Joe had. That is, from a technician stand point, but he just didn't know that, evidently he didn't know, I'm saying that, but I, I don't know what his reason was for coming, I just imagine that was his reason, 
sitting in with him because I don't know any other reason. Because he couldn't learn no music from anybody in the band because he knew as much or more music than anybody in the band because those boys weren't. And they had some great musicians that were all about like Louie and Joe, Speller, get a new tune, take it home or somewhere in the on it, then come back and play it. There wasn't no band set no music up. Yeah, you boys, I want to see how this sounds. Give everybody his part and then go on back to listen at him. You wouldn't recognize your own tune if you do that to those fellas, because some of them didn't read it all. Tony was well up. Well, Tony didn't play with it. Tony never played with no band. I don't Did remember. Tony put his own stuff down on paper? Or no, 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 no. Tony couldn't put nothing down on paper. But his name, Tony Jackson. No, you got no writer. Very few of those boys are. Now the boy, my, my another one of my friends, Dave Payton, I guess you know, had the band so long to read the theater. He was this boy. I see his picture in the paper. Uh, Sunday, uh, Lawrence Welk. He was Lawrence Welk's uh, arranger. This day, Peyton was. Now, it's very few of those boys. Well, boys, boys that can arrange. That is, of uh, the mu musicians, among the musicians, the ones that can arrange can't play nothing. Like they said about Gershon in Paris. They get that fellow. Why, why don't you have your piano tuned? They told the old boss, and why don't you have your piano tuned in the in the in the daytime? They was that night, and this was one of the nights, and Gushing was writing something, I don't know, was getting something to do. Yeah, it sounded like a piano tune of that night. <laughs> so you know, now you know, you know how them arrangers do, they have the paper they'll make two or three chords, and then they'll write it down, and then two or three, little another passage and write it down. <laughs> no, he never had a job playing no, no, for no one. Gushing did. You knew that, didn't you? No, he never had a job. He couldn't play enough to get no job. And could outright anybody. <laughs> oh, that was good. Burley is. Good Burley. He used to sing. He was singing waiter. Can't put nothing down yet. Well, he can't put nothing in the middle. There's nothing Burley has ever written. And as how he wrote hundreds of songs that he put on himself. He can't. So the boys had to do it for him. Not that kind of a musician. Creator. Uh, now I played with Mr. Porter. Yeah, I played right on the bench, right beside him. He sat on the right and showed me how he wanted me to play. Uh, Love for Sale. He hadn't written this, uh, these other songs. Um, Love for Sale. Favorite tune, the way they taught you like, what you thought was your favorite tune, and uh, then the judges would get together and, and they always disagree, you see, because there, there'd be a lot of people that buy and drinks that always in some night spots where they sold drinks, and uh, naturally the disagreements would, would come about to make you play more. Keep, the, keep the those people in the same, keep them buying that, that, that stuff, you see. <laughs> so, uh, they always, the fellas always had two, three, two. The whole price was good for him. That is ragtime. It was like Ward Derby on the side all the time, all on one ear. What was Price's first name or his last name? Piano Price, all, all anybody ever knew, all I ever knew. Uh -huh. Piano Price, he died in Pittsburgh. But he had mustache. That's when ball players had mustache. You, you don't remember that, do you? I've seen pictures. Yeah, we had. Uh, had uh, Rube Boss had a third baseman named Danger Talbot, had great long mustache. He could twist them all around out here. And uh, <laughs> the big leagues had ball players with long mustaches in those days. But those days are gone forever. You got to look like a boy now. Even Dutch Nevin look, 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 looks like a boy. He's been in the big leagues almost 30 years. <laughs> he looks like a kid now. <laughs> uh, the old piano price. Let's see now if I can.
It's no name prizes, no name red. <laughs> well, you were also a good friend of Jairo Morton, is that right? Very much so. How did you get to know him? Oh, uh, no, Jolly Roll. When you first come up there, I met all of them when they first come up. And then I was a jelly in Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, then Seattle. 19 and 19. That's, that's the last of the jelly out that way. And all the rest of the time is back this way. In New York, I was with, with 132nd and uh, right off 7th Avenue, back of Big John's at 132nd and 7th. He had a whole gang. You know, Jelly, Jelly, Jelly Roll was the greatest talking musician I guess anybody ever saw. And then 90% of his talks about himself. <laughs> he wasn't so wrong, but he was, he was a great, great kind of piano player. But he told us one night that had the whole crowd around him. And uh, he said he wished he, he, he was trying to get on the air with Paul White. That's when Paul White and band was great king of jazz. He said, I'd love to get on on the air with him. He wanted to, he wants to, wanted to ask uh, Paul Whiteman what was jazz, what jazz was. He called himself the king of uh, jazz. And what is jazz? And he wants to ask Paul that question. He says, I, I know he can't answer it. He was telling us, I know he can't answer it. He wants to ask it. Well, I doubt what he can answer for them. <laughs> this is just one of those things that you, it's the same music, right, straight on. It's the same music now that that uh, they heard this fellow Biscuits. They, they said the Biscuits are uh, doing the World's Fair in Chicago. Now, that first World's Fair, of course, that's before my time. And uh, they said they went, to, they, they had a, 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 said a Negro boy p playing piano that uh, all they knew was Biscuits. They called him Biscuits. And uh, since Ragtime, they call, couldn't all they call it syncopation. Then at the turn of the century, ragtime. Then jazz, swing and all, but it's all one and the same thing. They just give it different names, you know, to make it sound better. Goodman's uh, uh, would play, uh, say for an example, uh, uh, Paul Whiteman would play any, any jazz tune and it would be jazz. If Benny Goodman played the same thing in the same tempo, <laughs> it would be a different name. Same tempo, I mean, the same beat and everything. It would be swing then. You know all that, that it does. It shows it don't mean a thing, because a drummer in both bands are doing this, getting that same old beat. It's either four or a bar or, or two with that wide bush, with that fan, you know. <laughs> Do you think you could uh, play the Jelly Roll Blues? Oh yes, I can play that. That is great. Look how far ahead of uh, the present day music. Of course, that's present day music, but look how far ahead, how far, how far back it was. And that went for, that went for uh, years and years before it was ever put on paper. Just, everybody knew it. Just, Do you know what year that was written? No. No. No, it must have been written around. Oh. It was music. It was being played around the world War one. I know. It must have been written around sixteen, or fifteen, around back around in, in those years. Uh, it was written after 13, because th it wasn't written in 13. He hadn't, he hadn't conceived that idea in 1913.
so old man, Jolly. Ferdinand Morton. Oh, excuse me while I take a sip. Sure. With this lemonade. Ah. <laughs> uh. Oh, yeah. I remember one we talked about once before. I <coughs> Baby, I love to steal you, or something, something like that. That's Tony Jackson. Well, oh. that, that might not have been the exact name. It was something along that line. Baby, I love to steal you. Can't think of what it was now. I'll never get a chance much to play those tunes out. I'll forget them if I don't wake up and... How about some other... Uh, I don't remember. Tonky monkey ray. Williams, you come over there with Spence. Boy, that wrote uh, Basin Street Blues. And I ain't got nobody. Spence is there yet? He's going to argue with Spence the rest of his life. He never did come back. He stayed. Fats came back and went to the coast. And come back, coming back east to New York on a train, he died then in uh, 
the mayor came pretty much going into Kansas City. You see, Fats was uh, like a whole lot of people that's not in the music game. He allowed himself to get too fat and didn't do anything by it, you know. Just keep on eating pork chops and chicken and dumplings. And, you know, when you get that fat, you you got to cut out a lot of those things you like. And go around eating those 909 million calories a day. Gravy. Lady, put a little more gravy on this chop and all that stuff. <laughs> Me, cause I can do it, you see, and you, you could you do it too, because you were around, you were around 180, 90, 190, yeah. Look at me, I'm 168. I was 168 in 1946. I was 168 in 36. I was 168 in 26. Stay between 65 and 70. Back, back in the World War I days, I stayed 65 and 70. Still that. I remember you played a, a number for me of Lucky Roberts. Uh, jump oh, Jumpman Rag, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's great piano play. Just got mad at which woman and all that. You know, money spoils a lot of good musicians, good good artists. Spoils a lot of them. You know, just could have spoiled us. We ain't no good. Could have spoiled us. Somebody hand us fifty grand, a hundred grand. You know. When you fall out of that, you don't you don't want to see one of these things. <laughs> hey, no, no. <laughs>
she looked at me and sighed Then to her I replied You may talk about your jelly rolls But none of them compare with my baby My pretty baby She's a tall dark gal with big brown eyes and curly hair I call her baby, my pretty baby Now maybe not today, but there'll come a time When you'll hear those church bells chime When it comes to loving, that's exactly where she shines This pretty baby of mine Today, but there'll come a time when you'll hear those church bells chime. Kings and queens may reign supreme, but none of them outshine. Good looking baby of mine, yes, this pretty baby of mine.
through this up to now this year that, that, that any American took part in. I guess it's uh, Miss uh, Grace Kelly wedding, I guess, huh? Yeah, I had a lot of advice for her, but I couldn't write it. There was no way I could uh, get it, get an introduction, but I tried my best. I even told a man to tell her that um, I'm the guy that married the girl that broke up the home of the girl that married the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo. She went with me and she made me fall, but I wouldn't do that again for all the money in the banks of Monte Carlo. You know, if I hadn't bet at roulette, I'm sure that I'd be single yet, and neither the banks nor I would have regrets. For I'm the guy that married the girl that broke up the home of the girl that married the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo. When I walk along the old Bois of Boulogne with my independent air, while the people stop and stare, say he must be a millionaire. Well, you can hear them sigh as I pass by, see them wink their other eye. He's the guy that broke the bank at Monte Carlo, but I'm not. I'm only the guy that married the girl that broke up the home of the girl that married the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo. She wanted with me and she made me fall, but I wouldn't do that again for all the money in the banks at Monte Carlo. Now if I hadn't bet that rule yet, I'm sure that I'd be single yet. Neither the banks nor I would have regrets. For I'm the guy that married the girl that broke up the home of the girl that married the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo. Chicago Tribune and Gloria Swanson would only be my wife. Then if I own the Pennsylvania Railroad, then I know that I'd be satisfied with life. I saw 
you'd go out west, folks, to Utah and settle down among those Mormons out there. You know one wife, boys, is mighty fine, but it ain't like a man having eight or nine. Old Brigham Young sure had the right idea. So if you saw what I saw, you'd rush out west to Utah and grab a few up quick cause they going fast. You get some long ones, short ones, and some fat ones too. <laughs> but believe me, brother, you're gonna have a whole lot to do. I wish I was out in that Mormon land. up quick cause they're going fast. There's long ones and short ones and some lovely fat ones too. But lead me brother, you're gonna have a whole lot to do. But I wish I was out in that modern land. But she swore it was a duck. She placed it on the table, but had both of its legs stuck up. My sister walked in and took a spoon from a glass and commenced to serve the dressing from its... <laughs> yes, yes, yes. folks are doing it. The young folks, they are doing it too. But the young folks now are able to teach the old ones what to do. They go way over north in Lincoln Park where they have such lovely green grass. And when they can't shake the shoulders, <laughs> it's the, uh, yeah. Marciana and Jersey Joe Walcott was matched for that fight. A lot of those smart alecks in New York thought it wasn't right. There's a gang of them that said Walcott had just a little too much class. <laughs> but Marciana placed Mr. Walcott upon yeah. The night before Christmas, it was pretty quiet here in this house. There was a very little stirring, not even a mouse, when suddenly, upon the rooftop, a little noise did pass. What we found out was old Santa Claus up there sliding on his, yes, yes, yes. 